Hello again, it is uh, Machine Learning Prospects and Applications 2015. We are in Berlin in the office of Yandex again with our next guest. This is uh, Michael Levin from uh, Yandex Data Factory, Chief Data Scientist of Yandex Data Factory in fact. So hello Michael, thanks uh, a lot for, for the talk and thanks a lot for coming in and coming to us. Uh, Yandex Data Factory, what is that? So that is a kind of uh, internal startup at Yandex. Uh, for a uh, goal for which is to apply our assets such as uh, computing resources and machine learning infrastructure and most of all our data scientists to solve problems of other companies in totally different industries such as uh, for example telecom companies or uh, banking industry or metallurgy or even federal road agencies. Can you give maybe one particular short example of the industry with which you've already had experience working? Yeah, so basically all the industries I've mentioned, we already have some experience. So for example, in telecom, uh, one of the uh, oldest problems that they have is that uh, the users switch from one telecom provider to another, and then uh, there is only a limited user base. You cannot grow when you're a telecom, you already have all users connected to at least one. And then if they go from you, you just lose your revenue. So they want to somehow preserve them from going to others and then uh, they need to actually predict who is the most likely to go next week to their competitor. Why next week? Because they have to have a week to prepare uh, for this event and to make some campaign for prevention of churn. This, they call this event churn when somebody switches. Yeah, yeah. So actually, we can do predictive models who do, which do that basically better than how they do that. Although they were working with, for these problems for many years, but uh, we're more focused on machine learning itself, so our models are just predicting better. Maybe two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I wanted to change my mobile operator and I quit one of the tariff plans that I was using and then last week they've sent me uh, via email and via their app some really nice offer, so I, I came back. So this is kind of the, the Yeah, this is the kind of saw. thing they, they do, although usually it is uh, much less but for me For uh, me it looked like obvious. a brute, very brute and simple idea. Okay, the guy switched the, wants to switch the plan, he quit one plan, let's offer him another. So what's the difference? Uh, like you could incorporate, incorporate more factors in your model? Yeah, okay. basically if you already uh, switched off some of your tariff plans, that's obvious that you're going yeah. to do something. But uh, it could be much less obvious, like your activity is decreasing or you're starting to deal to completely different numbers in different countries or cities and then you might want to switch because of that. So what we monitor is a lot of statistics about user behavior and then we can predict uh, the top probable churners and then uh, the company cannot send discounts to everybody, right? Yeah. Otherwise they just lose revenue from everybody. So they want to send uh, discounts and uh, good offers to some top. And then if we're better at determining who are real churners in that top, then more people who really would have churned receive these offers. And uh, there are less people who just receive these offers because they're lucky, which is maybe not so good for users, but it's better for the company. You also mentioned in your talk that uh, you're using MatrixNet which is a uh, proprietary um, like system of, of Yannix machine learning, um, like machine intelligence system, or is it applied in every task? Like um, you were comparing, you were asked to, uh, if you compared this with HGBoost, for example. Uh, this is an open source solution that's currently quite popular among the people who are just interested in, in, in data science. And, uh, I don't know, in majority of Kaggle competitions you always can find uh, some AG boost examples of, of certain classification problems or whatever. Um, so yeah, uh, could you tell us a bit more about MetricsNet? So, so uh, in uh, scientific terms it's just an implementation of uh, gradient boosting over decision trees but of course with a lot of tweaks and heuristics that make it much better. So the main advantage that I see is that basically uh, you don't have to tune parameters to get the best performance out of it. I mean, you can tune them a little bit, but most of the results you get already with the first run. And then the results are usually uh, from several to several dozen percent better than other models that we encounter, including, for example, XGBoost. So we, uh, we also compared, of course, with XGBoost. The difference with that is not uh, that big, but uh, the key point is that uh, running MagicNet once, you get a quality several percent better than XGBoost after tuning it for a lot of iterations, basically. So okay. it, uh, it is applied for most of our problems, but there are some areas where uh, 
Uh, gradient boosting is not the leading technique, for example, images or speech, where we apply our also our uh, proprietary implementations of deep neural nets to solve those problems like image classification or yeah, there were a lot of talks on deep learning yeah, yeah also yeah. this is uh, like uh, a hit topic for the last several years because they've won a lot of competitions on images and speech and lately they also made huge progress in uh, machine translation which basically aligned them with 20 years of prior research on statistical machine translation with just a huge uh, neural network. I mean that's not that simple but still uh, it was a huge leap. Ten years ago um, social uh, networks were not a big deal. Nobody, well everybody knew that social creatures m make a network and everybody knew that there is a graph theory, but graph theory was a very nice uh, area of uh, pure mathematics that some, uh, you know, uh, enthusiasts were working in. So, do you see some areas of knowledge uh, and, um, I mean, I'm speaking here about something that's now considered purely academical, maybe even, that's going to be big like in the next three or five years. So, do you see some areas that people should start studying now. <laughs> I see it from a, a little bit different angle. So I mm -hmm. have to make a disclaimer that I'm a math major. Okay. So when there it was a... Fair enough, I think. When, when it was a, a hit of being a software engineer, I was a math major, but then to learn uh, computer science and programming was relatively easy after you already had your math major. So now I, I'm a little bit like requalifying to data scientist, which is also not that hard when you already know a lot of math and, and you understand the, the general science. principles. So in terms of data science, I think there will be anyway a huge demand for data scientists and all those who go now into different programs of data science of different levels, they all be of demand. But to be really one of the top ones who are in the most demand, you should be really understanding the underlying uh, uh, math behind those algorithms, behind all those statistical tests and all that. So basically you can use open source tools which are already polished enough to solve a lot of problems and you can do that well, but to do that extremely well and to apply that to new problems which were not solved before you, you have to really understand the math behind it. So my recommendation is at first, you should know your math. More specifically, of course, probability, probability theory and statistics. But of course, things like uh, graphs pop up. Yeah. And then the number theory, which was considered a useless uh, theoretical science for thousands of years, became like one of the most important in uh, cryptography. So there are a lot of examples like that. And they happen and they will happen in the future, obviously. Data scientist is a combination of math computer science uh, programming and uh, applications of machine learning like uh, get some experience solving some problems go to Kaggle go to I don't know top coder data science marathons yeah. and uh, uh, try to look at different uh, online programs for data science although uh, they are very different on level and keep that in mind so you might be going through a course or a specialization online but uh, you shouldn't consider your, an expert, yourself an expert after that because some of them are really not very deep. Yeah, sure. So uh, in comparing like being an expert in some programming language like R or in IPython notebooks or digging deeper into statistics, I would definitely select the latter. Uh, the last question would be about the event in general. So how do you like the event? How do you like the, the set of topics, the set of speakers? Do you have some suggestions for the next one, maybe there should be parallel sessions or maybe there should be some topics that are not covered in this one or something like that. Well, I think the event is, is actually great. So the most important thing for such events is the speakers and uh, the speakers like Vapnik or Vovk uh, and uh, Lior Wolf and uh, Nathan and Traitor are both great uh, scientists and they are and from speakers, various actually. areas and they are great speakers and also we have this great venue with a view on Berliner Dome and uh, a lot of museums and walks around here so that's a great thing. Uh, talking about sections, I personally don't like very much that uh, thing when you have several sections because then you have to really choose and sometimes you have to choose between two very interesting topics to you. 
So I think it's cool that you can actually attend all the lectures here and each of them is a gem of its own kind. So that's basically, that's great. And uh, talking about uh, suggestions, well, I mean, it's uh, basically uh, two areas from where we get uh, topics. One of them is uh, where the recent advances in science are, like deep learning for example or intelligent or, learning yeah or intelligent uh, learning by presented, yeah. yes uh, and interesting applications so healthcare or maybe metallurgy as uh, in one of the projects we currently have at Yandex data factory so maybe something from there or climate or weather prediction yeah. i mean people don't believe it uh, it can be predicted but uh, there are some no, advances with climate, there. with climate people do believe that yeah but i think you know, the, 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 i think the huge weather issue. I think the huge issue is seismic things, like uh, that there were even a series of papers that uh, the papers that claim that they can predict this seismic activity are actually inherently wrong. And there was like an up story analysis of a bunch of this se seismic predictions that mm -hmm. they are doing a very bad job. But I think with the weather, it's there, there are actually, I think, Mm, there is this really good book by, by Nate, and, uh, Nate, Nate Silver and uh, Signal in the Noise, and mm -hmm. he's got the whole. Uh, section on, on, on weather forecasting and as far as I understand the question is now about the measurement so, so the computation power is strong enough and the methods are there the question is if we can get enough measurement stations all over the place. Well that's one of the issues but actually it turns out that machine learning applied to uh, on top of uh, the current uh, meteorological models can also give a huge boost to the quality okay. so, so that's a topic of interest I think and also, I mean, uh, the, for regular people, it's like a common uh, knowledge that weather cannot be predicted well. And the first thing anybody uh, who, who is like any client who is relatively far from the area ask, OK, so can you predict weather? Yeah, right. <laughs> and then when we can, that already uh, starts a better conversation. Yeah, uh, the, 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 he gives there a really nice uh, example that the weather channels artificially make the predictions worse because uh, it's important for, 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 for them that the viewer doesn't get disappointed with their prediction. So they artificially reduce the quality of their prediction for the sake of the satisfaction of the user. Because when the user hears that there's going to be bad weather and it's actually good, the user is all right. Mm -hmm. But when the viewer says it's going to be shiny and beautiful, so, and then he comes out and it's a snowstorm. Yeah. You know, so so it's, it's, it's very interesting how uh, the um, quality of the forecast is actually reduced due to the will of, of the of the clients, yeah. But basically, so that is a question of uh, balance between errors of first and second kind, and then yeah. basically uh, have to do A/B testing uh, probably in different parts of a city to give different forecasts, and then see to which of the forecast people uh, react better. Because at some level, if you don't make at all uh, predictions of shiny weather when it is actually bad, when you can always predict bad weather, but nobody will be happy. So, so, there is so, some so, so by the way, coming to that, can you predict weather? <laughs> well, in, in uh, YD, I yeah. mean, that, that, that is... Uh, <laughs> that, that's, uh, maybe, maybe there is there is a viewer who is thinking to address you, so can you predict weather? So, so there is something to talk about. I mean, that is... Uh, the, the details are under NDA, but okay. there is something to talk about. So basically you can, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was Michael Levin, uh, Chief Data Scientist from Yandex Data Factory here in Berlin on the conference of Yandex Machine Learning uh, Prospects and Applications. Thanks a lot, Michael, for coming. Thank you. Uh, so a pleasure to talk to you and see you around. Have a good event. Thanks. <laughs>